National Congress uh, conference which is underway in Nazarek, uh, just south of Johannesburg and literally a stone's throw away from the iconic suburb township which is Soweto and uh, more than 5,000 delegates have uh, descended upon this venue uh, to decide their future in terms of policies as well as their leadership and the leadership race is uh, about to get underway as we uh, get into the phase of the nomination yeah, process, Leanne. Indeed. So since we left you, uh, basically what's been happening is that we've seen the delegates going for lunch, the media going for lunch, and a lot of talk around uh, what's been happening with those final constituencies and uh, that uh, national elective credential uh, marks that have been approved. So if you're just tuning in, let's just remind you of what has been announced today. And this is what we've been waiting for. We've been waiting since last night to hear the credentials and those approved uh, votes and nominations that are allowed to take place. So what we do know is that a total of 4,776 votes are going to be cast for uh, the respective and top positions of the ANC and uh, the winning delegate basically needs 2,389 of those votes to uh, take over as the president of the ANC. It's been broken down into all of the provinces, it's also been broken down into the PEC and and of course into the Youth League, the Women's League, the Veterans League and the NEC having 86 of those votes. So there's been a lot of guesswork taking place and that's exactly what it is. I mean, Peter, we've, yeah. we've been very, very forthright in saying that any projection, any prediction that comes through at this stage is guesswork because this can go in anybody's favor. We do know that uh, uh, every single uh, delegate has the privacy of their own vote. They are able to go into that voting booth. They're there's a form printed with the face of the uh, respective uh, delegate that is running for the presidency printed on that and they cross who their favorite is. Nobody knows who they're voting for. It is a secret an anonymous ballot and it goes into a box and it then yeah. is counted. So there's a lot that we don't know, but what we do know is that uh, Balakambete won't be on that list. Yeah. She withdrew her name uh, late last night and uh, she's thrown her weight behind uh, Sura Ramaphosa and uh, joined him his cause. Uh, what we also know is that uh, the uh, might be an, an, uh, an agenda item which is going to see a changing of the structure of the top six. It will become the top seven yeah. because they're adding the position. This is what's being mooted. I, I guess it has to go through the processes of having a second Deputy Secretary General. So there'll be three people around the SG cluster and uh, we'll get an, uh, uh, um, uh, an analysis or a rationale behind that move. So basically, in a nutshell, for layman, there'll yeah. be two Jesse Duartes. Yes. That's, you know, that's yeah. what it is. So right. uh, if that is adopted. So let's get an analysis now. We've got uh, two of our uh, political analysts with us. Uh, uh, with us a bit earlier, of course, was Professor Tiniko Maloleka uh, staying with us. Thanks very much. And then, of course, Ralph Pacheca joining us here on the special broadcast. Good to have you. And thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for inviting me. Two Deputy Secretary Generals. If this goes through, I mean, what, what's the rationale behind something like this? I think that uh, what concerns the ANC is to manage any potential fallout out of this. So if you have a two Deputy Secretary General, you do have an opportunity to actually have a meaningful compromise on those positions below that of the President. I do think that uh, anything below the Deputy President is an area where compromise can actually be hatched so that you make sure that you do not uh, create out right losers uh, out of this conference you make sure that in those key positions of the party maybe the 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 the, the, the delegates will vote in a way that uh, they push the party towards some form of a uh, compromise within those positions it but will certainly help if it comes out uh, as an opportunity to compromise instead of being seen as something that could create an opportunity where people have uh, the winner takes all kind of an attitude and mentality so the bigger the better the main issue with the end see now is to just in, involve as many people as you can within that top six make it a top seven okay. just to manage potential fallout Prof, do you agree with that because you know when we had two deputy ceos at standard bank everyone <laughs> cried foul they said this is ridiculous yeah is this not the same kind of thing I, it, some people might even say it's insulting if well, i'm well, tagged uh, on just to appease people well, at Standard Bank, there was no fighting uh, with those two CEOs. I, 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 you know, 
Maybe the second deputy general secretary will deal with the court cases uh, because the ANC has had to deal with a lot of court cases. I think there is, there is an administrative reason also uh, beyond the issues of politics and compromise because that office really has a lot of work uh, to do. And, and, and we have seen uh, the general secretary almost buckle under pressure of the work that he has to do in terms of uh, uh, mediating uh, 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 across the provinces, uh, the office work that has to be done, and, and of course the, the diplomatic work that uh, you know, may, may be done better by one of the deputies. In other words, you, you increase the skill set inside of the, of the General Secretary's office. So, while I agree that there are politics and compromise and accommodation issues here, there's also a purely administrative issue that uh, that office uh, really has, has a lot on its plate, has had more over the years to deal with than, uh, than, than before. Don't you think that, I mean, the whole argument has been that this cabinet is too inflated. There are too many ministers, deputy ministers, NEC members, top six. Now we're thinking of a top seven. It's just too heavy. And now there's talk of adding more. I mean, I don't know. I think it's a, it's a response to a crisis. I mean, at this point, it wouldn't help to try to be lean. You have to be as accommodating as possible. And my view here is that uh, I don't really think you do need that technical capacity within there. I think that uh, the main problem that uh, is a within the office of the Secretary General, it is the, the, the attitude, the type of cadres that the ANC uh, actually uh, attract these days and whether the institutions of the party, your constitution, your structures, your process of nomination and all those, have they been modernized? You really need to think about that and I think that will be much of a long-term project of trying to actually modernize the party. I mean, if you have uh, one Secretary General and the branches are in good standing, there is no environment of mutiny within the branches as we have seen uh, uh, the crisis within the branches. You can still get the work done, you'll have branches that actually cooperate with you. But is this not dealing with the symptoms and not the actual problem? Because the reason that you're creating this new position partly is to appease. But surely what you should be doing is saying, what caused the unease in the first place and deal with it? Yeah, look, I mean, certainly you can't deal with the organizational problems by creating more positions any more than you can deal with the factions within the ANC by creating more deputy minister positions or even more new minister positions which we have seen the Zuma administration attempt to do uh, creating um, more deputy positions a much bulky uh, cabinet than we have ever seen did it solve the problem of factions it didn't if anything, it fueled it, uh, in, in, in my opinion. So I, I hope that the rationale for a second deputy is more to do with workload, more to do with administration, and work more to do with the management of that than the idea that the second deputy will, will calm the nerves or appease this or that faction. I doubt if that, that will happen. All right, so uh, in between conferences, the ANC saw fit to create this body known as the NEC uh, to make decisions on behalf of the party and the broad church. And uh, a little bit earlier on, we spoke to a former deputy ANC Youth League leader, Ronald Namola, and these are the thoughts that he had about the functioning of the NEC. And I'd like you to listen and uh, give us your reflections on what his diagnosis was. With regard to the delays that have been attributed to the effects of the court judgments, I think uh, members of the ANC must welcome the interventions of the courts because the constitution of the ANC is not above the constitution of the court of the, of the country. And um, when you join the ANC as a voluntary association, you are not surrendering your rights. You, you, you still remain with your rights. So if there are challenges and you have exhausted all internal processes in the ANC, you have gone everywhere, mm -hmm. you must be able to approach the but court. President Zuma said that uh, members that are doing that are creating the impression that the party is losing its discipline. 
But it's not an impression, it's a reality that it is. I mean, the NEC must be able to deal with the factionalism, it must deal with disputes fairly, it, must, it doesn't need the court to, to deal with this. So the, the NEC had abdicated its responsibility to deal with dispute fairly. So that's why you see the courts intervening. If the NEC was dealing with issues properly and resolving these disputes, we will not be sitting with courts. So if members are grieved, they have went everywhere, they went to the SG's office, the dispute is not resolved, what must they do? And, uh, and, uh, and the Mangao, it's, it's not true that uh, the ANC had said in Mangao people who have went to court must be automatically expelled. The ANC said when you have exhausted internal processes, you must be allowed to exercise your right because the ANC constitution is not above the constitution of the country. All right, so <laughs> your reflections on his diagnosis and his analysis is that there was an, a paralysis or uh, unwillingness for the ANC to do its job. Look, the NC is not short of structures, and I'll, I'll, I'll put it out there that uh, if you compare the NC with any other political party in South Africa, it, it comes across as one of the most democratic when it comes to internal processes, if you look at the structures. The problem with the NC is the unwillingness of members of the NC to accept the dictate of their own institutions. Even regarding the court intervention, there is no way where the court is actually saying to the NC that your constitution is wrong. The courts in most cases are saying to the NC, follow your own processes. We have put them in place. All you have to do is to follow your own process. So it's not a question of the structures of the ANC. I believe they need to be modernized, no doubt, so that they can adapt to the complexity of a modern society. But I think it has to do with the attitude. It is about willingness to accept the result of processes that you think are free and fair. That is the attitude that they need to work on. It requires discipline. It requires hard work at the branches. They also need to be vetting processes. Who do they admit into their branches? Do you just have to pay membership and you are a member? What are the processes that you have to go through before joining, before accumulating years within a branch? They need to go deep into those things and introspect. They will realize that uh, their own constitution is the best guide that they have as to how to go about the internal processes. Yeah, I, you know, Peter, I honestly think that the debate about whether to go to the courts or go internal is a dead one. I mean, this is a democratic, uh, a constitutional democracy. People can go to court. It's not illegal to do that. Uh, anyone who feels that their rights have been violated, I mean, the ANC or anyone can shout until they are blue in the face and saying don't go to the courts. People will go to the courts because they can, because they have that right to do. And it's a recourse that is available to everyone in the country. Yeah, I think, I guess, and, and, in normal society that's fine and that's true. You take on the state, etc., etc. But the ANC, by and large, is a private institution. It's a club of people who believe in the same thing and in theory um, belong to the same church. So, you know, it, it becomes odd for people from the outside looking in, thinking, what's happening with this family? They're suing each other all the time. Yeah, well, I mean, what's happening in that family is that the structures that are set up to deal with disputes have become ineffective. Apart from the bulge in, num in members who come there, obviously, unschooled in the rules of the family. But take the Integrity Committee. The Integrity Committee was established with such a, a, a pomp and ceremony because it was going to be this committee which was going to uh, resolve many of the internal disputes of the ANC. But that committee must still report to the NEC. And the NEC must still adopt the recommendations of that committee or not adopt them. And sometimes that committee, in fact, all the time, that committee is investigating members of the NEC. So you, 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 all you are doing is that you're sending your members to the courts mm -hmm. through it, having structures such as those. The, 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 the other issue, Prof, it's uh, the loss of credibility of the internal structures. Uh, the understanding is that the internal structure seems to have been appropriated by certain people. I mean, the integrity committee, the criteria that they use or they ought to use in deciding which cases need to be referred to, the question of fairness as well regarding that. So when, when some members, when some leaders of the ANC 
infiltrate the functioning of the structures of the NC to a point where the results of those structures are no longer acceptable. They are no longer actually, they will no longer be able to pass the scrutiny of the court. For me, that is actually the core of the problem. It, you can bring up as many structures as you can. Actually, the more structures you bring, you are multiplying the problem. You gotta look at the attitude. You gotta look at the people. You cannot keep on saying that uh, uh, members of the ANC need to understand uh, the, 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 the value system that come with Owaratambo. They need to adhere to that. That for me does not amount to a sufficient guide on how you deal with someone's character. You gotta put the institution right there clear. If you have conflict of interest above five million, declare it. Be strict on how the internal structures of the ANC function and be strict on vetting members that are going to join the party because if there is any people who are bringing destruction and all to the ANC, it's the members themselves through the very institution of the ANC. Actually, the court comes as a rescue to the constitution of the NC against members of the NC who are vandalizing their own constitution. Well, not only members, <laughs> not only members, because the president himself, I mean, the irony of the president saying, don't go to the courts. Yeah. How many times has he been to the courts yeah. himself yeah. Uh, exactly. to seek redress for this or that? So, you know, people are watching him yeah. and they've seen it work for him a few times. Why shouldn't they uh, do the same? Exactly. Interesting. Yeah. It is. It really is. It is. It's an interesting <laughs> conversation. I just want to throw something in. I've been while while the conversation's been going. I've been just watching uh, what's coming out and some of the latest happenings. And and perhaps I'm late on picking this up. And 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 you can correct me if I'm wrong. But I'm seeing a report coming through now that as much as we've been reporting on the fact mm. that uh, Lindiwe Sisulu has uh, in principle agreed to be the running mate of Cyril Ramaphosa, we're seeing some reports coming through that outgoing and Pumalanga ANC chairperson David Mabuza is uh, now now saying that he's going to accept being the running mate with, of course, Zanat Lamini Zuma, which uh, puts a little bit of a, um, a, a, a different spin on this whole unity and where the votes for Mpumalanga are going. I mean, were you expecting I, I something like this? I never had doubt about the So you had no well, doubt? I've, I've, I've okay. been on morning so that, that yeah. clear yes. that my view is that David Mabuza was trying to maximize what he can get out of this conference. Right. Yeah. He was sure he has had a position within the NDZ camp. That was very clear. But where I thought he was being ambitious and trying to gauge the power balance was to say that, you know what, not only am I going to accept to be the running mate, I can also have my person there. Can you bring me Paul Mashadile into this? That, that was for me overreaching on the side of uh, uh, Mr. Mabuza. Remember, he has never distanced himself from uh, Dameni Zuma. No. And naturally, I believe he will be a liability to Sil Ramaphosa's camp because of credibility problems. No doubt about it. The CL17 has assumed the credibility uh, 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 ticket, which they have framed as anti Zuma uh, 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 ticket. That ticket is just corrosive to the politics of Mr. Mabuza. I don't see him and I've never seen him fitting into that. Yeah. So, we, I mean, that, that yeah. sorry, sorry, no, Peter. No, I mean, if we look at the votes then in Mpumalanga, uh, that's, that's basically 708 well, votes. Well, the numbers, but can he course. deliver those? That's the question. Because, you know, people are yeah. talking about provinces and characters and that he's the... The, the kingmaker. The kingmaker. Yeah, yeah. Can he deliver all of those well, delegates? The king he wants to make is himself, <laughs> <laughs> in some ways. Um, I, I think, yeah, that is the crucial issue. He has the numbers. His province has the numbers. Uh, KZN has the numbers. And both of them have nominated Gozazan as Aminisuma. The question is whether, as well as unity, this character called unity, <laughs> There is another character called conscience, <laughs> Nembeza, the one we were talking about earlier. Yeah. If there is this character called Nembeza, uh, Nembeza could uh, shipwreck uh, the whole thing. Because people could, could vote in a manner that cannot be based on the numbers that we have had. In, in other words, the relationship between the outcome and the provincial nominations could be chalk and cheese. It, 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 it's very possible, you know. So I, I wouldn't be so sure. I'm not surprised that Mabuza has, has, has revealed his cards. His cards were not that hidden <laughs> for a long time yeah. anyway. I also think it's significant if uh, Lindwe Sisulu has spoken and said that she is on the uh, Ramaphosa camp because 
In his speech yesterday, the president almost implied that the Women's League has facilitated the candidature of three women. And, and, and of course we know that the Women's League has only facilitated one, one, one woman's yeah. candidature. Yeah. It's not true. And I think that what's happening now is that they are speaking out to say we, we, we are independent of that, at least that lot in the, in the, in the Women's League. Well. I, I, I also think, you know, when you look at the women issue, the process that they seem to have followed or failed to follow uh, the Women's League, I, I think that uh, Balagan Bete's decision uh, to endorse uh, Sil Ramaphosa, it, it's, it, it's an angry reaction. Yeah. I think she has been rejected by, yeah. by the Dlamini Zuma side. And I, I feel that uh, when you look at it, you look at the role she has played within parliament and in relation to the stability of President Jacob Zuma's administration, it, it appears to me it is someone who expected more from that side. And she's taken uh, bullets uh, for him. Uh, certainly, and I think <laughs> that uh, she's the most betrayed on the, uh, the manner in which she feels about it. Yeah. And uh, there had never been open discussion regarding the gender ticket. And I think the emergence of Lindue Sisulu and, and, and Balega Mbete, uh, their availability, it, 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 it gave an indication that uh, they have doubts as to whether Dlamini Zuma is the rightful bearer of the gender ticket if that is the ticket she's running on uh, uh, within, that, within, within that camp. I think they have doubts about it. Perhaps they would have wanted much wider consultation so that they can look at a pool of women to see who will be the rightful bearer of this ticket so that at least they can take it somewhere. Well, I mean, it certainly seems that it is whoever has the sweetest deal at the moment because mm -hmm. uh, clearly the promises that are being made in the run-up to this are now, you know, uh, let's see who can offer me what. And exactly. we're seeing this with David Mabuza, we're seeing this with Balek and Bete. Clearly the Ramaphosa side is saying, listen, you know, come with us and we'll promise you that. I mean, we're just assuming that that's what that's all about. So when we talk about that, the sweet deal, the individual standing there voting, you never know what it is that's going on in their minds. You never know what's been mm -hmm. promised to them. And, uh, and the fulfillment of that promise at the end of the day, once they get that vote going. And, mm -hmm. and I think this is what this is all about. It's just, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's open to anybody. This is anybody's yeah, vote. At the individual level, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. I think you can never know, but what is happening also is that the individuals such as Lindy Wesisulu, such as Bale Gambete, are also trying to send a signal mm -hmm. to other members, the delegates, to yes. say, this is where I stand and I would encourage you to consider uh, voting in this direction. So it's more than just them thinking, well, of course, they are thinking about a position for themselves, but I think they are sending a message. Uh, it's lobbying. Mm. Uh, it's not merely them making choices for their individual selves. They are also lobbying. I also want to just bring up, I mean, we've been speaking about the introduction of a second uh, Deputy Secretary General of the ANC, but now I'm also reading that uh, we didn't think it would come through, but officially now it has been thrown out that the ANC has decided that it'll only have one Deputy President. I know that President Jacob Zuma had said, you know, we would, I think it would be better to have two Deputy Presidents of the country, but uh, of, I beg your pardon, of the party, but mm -hmm. that's not going ahead. They've said that this is, uh, this is not, this has not gone through. Uh, expected? Unexpected? For the deputy president? Yes. Oh yeah, look, can Kosazana and Cyril work together? I doubt if it was going to be ever possible, with one being president and the other being deputy. So I think perhaps the initial thought has now been, has now been watered down with the realism of looking at the candidates available and recognizing that they are not likely to be able to work together in that fashion. The same thing that Ralph was saying, a David Mabuza, uh, Cyril Ramaphosa ticket would have almost been impossible because of the divergence in, in, in ethical visions and, and, and moral visions between the two of them. So I, I think they've given up on it because they realize it will not work. It will make, it will simply make the, the top structure dysfunctional. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. It so, would have been interesting if they adopted or accepted the Secretary General Mandash's uh, plan or proposal to, 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 to start this process of voting, mm. deal with the president, and once you have dealt with the president, 
cool down a little bit and deal with the deputy because mm. once people know who is the president, you then have an opportunity to try to manage a situation where yeah. that president is but not going to lose the bigger chunk of the party. They'll never leave here. This will Failed. go on for the next totally two weeks. Totally rejected that one. Indeed. Um, <laughs> you know, we were doing the maths earlier on. So originally, if everybody was legitimate, there would have been, what, 5,816 delegates or something. That's been whittled down to 4,776. So, I don't know, I'm not what the maths is, but it's over 400 delegates that are probably not going to vote. The question now becomes, what if the person who wins, wins by a margin less than those people that have been excluded? What happens? What space do we get into? You mean if the, the, the victory is just... It's just below the amount of... Minimum yeah. votes, which is 2,800 Well, and you know, something. it makes the job of that person very difficult to start with because that person does not have, on the face of it, an overwhelming mandate. So they have to negotiate. They have to win people over. They have to uh, have a number of gestures that show that... Um, they are willing to, to take people from the other camp, as it were. Could it collapse the conference, though, in the sense that you've got a number of delegates who could have changed the vote, mm -hmm. not allowed to vote? I mean, Peter, this is a potentially a contentious issue. Mm. You're talking about those numbers that, if in case it comes that uh, had those people attended, mm. it could have changed things. I, I think, and uh, I'm, it's not... I'm, I'm not pushing conspiracy here or anything. I think that uh, those who have been barred from, at, from voting, we haven't had them committing that they will not challenge that after the conference. Remember, once the conference has been held, the results are out there, and then you have that margin, it will actually, people might look and say that, you know what, we have been stopped from attending, but we had not exhausted the legal route yet. We have a, the, the, the case and case appeal that is yet to be dealt with, but the, con the conference is going ahead. I, I believe that uh, after this conference, people will start thinking about some of the processes, contentious processes leading to this, that could actually be used to delegitimize the results if they are not happy. So for, 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 for there not to be a contention based on those members who are not here, it will just depend on their great will, if they are willing not to challenge it. And I think that uh, institutionally, it's up to them. They can challenge. The, 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 the problem with this well, conference, until Peter... Until they haven't shown that good yeah. will. The, 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 exactly. Pro the problem with this, with this conference, Peter, is that uh, it is the conference that there are so, there's so much legal standing to challenge a lot. You know, and you can depend on the previous cases dealing with the province and the region. There is such a strong legal standing. Even when you come, even when you have sinister motive, legally, you have a leg to stand on and question this conference. It is the one that I think it is the most vulnerable, and I think what is going to be even more vulnerable, if it gets to those close margins, it is the legitimacy of the results. Well, I think that's what the president might have had in mind when he was trying to say, don't go to the courts. It was not so much, he was not so much talking about the past mm -hmm. yes, the as he was talking about, about the future. The, future. Yeah. the, the fear yeah. that this very conference might become the subject of litigation and much a longer legal wrangling. By what margin, and, and you know, maybe you can, I suppose, obviously educate a lot of viewers. I mean, we may be watching this and following this for the first time, but by what margin does a candidate have to win by? Or is it literally... 50% 50, 50 plus? 50% plus because the votes are 2,389. Mm -hmm. If the one gets 2,390, are they the winner? If you get 50 plus, if you get... If you get then there's that's no, it. There's, there's no half vote. I would say right. if you got a half vote, 50, 50 plus half <laughs> vote, just one, you'll be just one. Yes. And by but the that's look of where the problem starts. Exactly. And by that's the look of things, saying. they are very close. Yeah, by the but, look of but, things, but the legal issues are going to be complicated. They are not straightforward. Mm. Even if people challenge, because there is no way you can uh, you can go to court and argue that had I been able to vote, the results might have been different. But you can't tell how different they, they might have been. Yeah. You know, you can only say they might have been different. Uh, they might have been different and remained the same, but different in terms of, of the person who wins. The same person might have won. So 
I think it's going to be an interesting court, uh, court, court issue. If, if <laughs> it comes to the we're gonna, Gentlemen, we're going to pause for a moment because uh, our acting political editor, Sophie Mkwena, is standing by right now with the ANC's national spokesperson, Zizi Kodu. A hectic day today, uh, the second day of the ANC conference. This morning there was confusion whether uh, the credentials will be adopted. But indeed, finally, around 11 o'clock, the Deputy Secretary General of the ANC indicated that uh, the delegates or the conference has adopted the credentials. You are a happy man, Zizi. I'm quite excited. The program of the conference is proceeding in full steam. We just now took... Uh, a break for lunch. We were going back at about four o'clock. We were already dealing with uh, constitutional amendments, and there are now a number of things. Constitutional amendments, in as far as it relates to the structure called the National Executive Committee, you know that from the from the National Conference, I mean the National Policy Conference, which was held here, there were a number of proposals. For example, one, there was an option that you must have two deputy presidents. That has been uh, rejected. So what, what has been agreed, firstly, is to retain the status quo in terms of the presidency. You will have the president and one deputy. What we are coming back to, to make sure that we've got sufficient support, is the position that seems to have uh, uh, enjoys the support, but we need to confirm, either by show of hands or by secret ballot, the two deputy secretary generals. So when we come back at about, two, at about four o'clock, we'll now confirm that and immediately go for nomination. What's the rationale to enlarge the structure? The motivation is that the ANC if it does not incapacitate itself, it won't be able to deal, for example, the proposal of the two deputy secretary general is that we need to have a monitoring and evaluation within the office of the secretary general to monitor our deployees, to evaluate them in terms of their performance, including our programs, which at the moment we don't have. We need to, another deputy secretary to deal with elections and campaigns so that the organization there is consistent ongoing program, whether in elections and campaigns, as a political party which is also in government. The issue of uh, constitutional amendment, you're talking about the leadership, but in terms of the discussion documents, if you were perhaps to take us through some important uh, amendment, policy amendment, are we likely to see any that will strengthen the organization to be in a position to implement? Because people are saying, yes, good policies, but implementation, it's not happening. I think we appreciated that precisely the reason we want to create a new deputy secretary's office so that it can evaluate and monitor exactly the point you're making because that statement has been made on a number of conferences of the ANC that we've got good policies but you're not implementing but also we're not monitoring their implementation and I think since 1994 we've done well, quite a good work as an organization to change South Africa to make it a better country but among others we need to monitor the progress and the difference our policies are making so that you don't change what is or you don't fix what is working you don't just introduce midstream new policies and change what is working because you are in a policy conference or you're in a national conference so we need to retain what is working but make sure that we deepen and make sure that it achieves the objectives the way to do that you must make sure that you evaluate through the change it makes to ordinary people there were also proposals to strengthen the integrity committee can you take us through those recommendations? One of the proposals, for an example, is that we must amend the constitution in as far as Veterans League is concerned. Mm -hmm. So that the Veterans League must not be involved in the heli belly of the contestations and even it must not participate in the voting because there must be really the elders' council who must give us counselling when we are faced with these challenges. It must be a board of reference when the ANC is faced with serious difficulties. If you give them certain voting status, they become part of the heli belly, the problem of the ANC. That is a proposal. It's also a recommendation that, among others, we must strengthen the Integrity Commission because we think that the, the allegations of corrupt ANC are quite serious. Unless we give teeth to that body, so that its decisions must be effective. And this conference will have to deal with that in the context of protecting the image brand of the African National Congress. There are concerns that when you deal with issues of corruption, you target the flies, you leave the big elephant. How are you going to deal with that perception? Clearly, we saw what happened last week in terms of the court judgments around the head of state and particularly the leader of the organization. What is important is that we must deal with this perception without being denial about it. 
that we must deal with corruption with uh, the same way we deal with tigers. Tigers will be your principals, will be your ministers, your mayors, and flyers, flies will be your officials. The perception in public is that we are quick to deal with officials to cover the rot, which is in other words, in the perception, the principles. If the principle is found, you must not hesitate. And it's important to do so, so that we deal with the perception, so that we deal with the reality at some times, that unfortunately, officials uh, uh, get compromised because they do take the flag on behalf of the principles. That's why we, out of, arising out of this conference, we must deal with tigers and flies equally. And finally, the nomination process that is likely to start very soon after lunch. Can you take us through how it's done? Immediately what is going to happen at around 5 this afternoon, the election, which is the independent e election agency appointed, which was taking responsible for nominations from, it will, from branches, it will then announce who has, who has passed the nomination, the threshold, the quorum, to the plenary. That these are the names for the position of president up to the last position. They will then call for nominations from the plenary because it is allowed to do so. After which, if there are no further nominations, we will seal and close nominations of the top six or top seven, whatever number we agreed to. Then they'll be voting this late afternoon, early evening, possibly when elections in terms of the outcomes are announced tomorrow, we we'll then take further nominations, again the elections to nominations. The elections agency will say, these are the names that have qualified from nomination from branches and read out the list of names and take nominations from the floor and then allow voting the whole day tomorrow whilst the program of the conference is in process. And finally, this uh, voting, it is going to take a long day. Tomorrow the markets, people are concerned and international community in particular are watching. Are you not scared that uh, the delay is likely to have unintended consequences? We're not going to run the program on the basis of what markets want. We're going to run the program on the basis of what is good for this program and the African National Congress. So it, it means that slowly, like we delayed with, uh, with credentials, we did it for the integrity of the process in the ANC, so that we don't run programs without adopting credentials and yet you make yourselves vulnerable and because the process is contaminated. So we want to make sure whatever we do is in the best interest of the organization first and protect the integrity of the outcomes. The organizational report, are you going to the adopt it tonight? The organizational report certainly immediately as nominations are taken this afternoon throughout and early evening the, the organizational report will be presented by the Secretary General. Thank you so much. That Thank was you. Zizi Kwadwa, the spokesperson of the African National Congress. Back to you, Peter. Sophie, thank you very much indeed. So getting a bit of an explanation, but I think we're going to need some uh, further clarity on it. But uh, the nominations process is definitely going ahead today. And uh, voting uh, will probably continue right through till tomorrow, uh, yeah. whilst they still try to run the program at the yeah, same it time. It sounds like it. It sounds like that the, the voting process will happen throughout the night yeah. into the early hours of the morning. I mean, you've got to get through 4,700 and something delegates to, to be able to vote, but that is throwing this, yeah. throwing a massive yeah. curveball into this. I mean, that's, Professor, I mean, this is, this, is a, this is hugely delayed, and yet they've said that Wednesday night they're wrapping this up. It doesn't matter what happens, Wednesday is the closing. I mean, do you think this is possible with this much to fit into uh, such a short amount of time? Well, you know, I had uh, Zizi on the first day of conference in one radio station in the morning promising the result <laughs> by the end of Sunday. Okay. <laughs> Sunday morning, is it? <laughs> <laughs> and that is certainly not going to so happen. So it's not going to happen. Um, and I don't know... We, we, are, we are late by a day, so Wednesday is probably, uh, if, if things finish on Wednesday, it will be late in the night on Wednesday mm. uh, that things finish. All right, so as, uh, I mean, we're still no clearer to where we were when we came into conference, even though these chess pieces are starting to move around, uh, it still doesn't really tell us anything about where this conference is going in terms of leadership. No, not really. I mean, I, I suppose we're supposed to be thankful that the conference has started uh, at all. We're supposed to be thankful that the credentials have been adopted, uh, finally. <laughs> but I think there are still too many uh, question marks uh, about the, the, the process going forward. And uh, we, we must just be patient. Um, but I, I suppose, you know, once the, the, the nominations start, and the elections start, 
um, there's no going back. Uh, the only way to go back is if later on there is a court mm. challenge, as you rightly pointed out. Are there you. any dark horses that might emerge even at this late stage, especially now that we've been given a second position at the top seven, as it might become known as? Is there any individual that you think perhaps, you know, the media has ignored um, and that maybe the kind of person that might be need to be brought in at this late stage? You know, I'm, I'm not sure about that. Mm. I, I think the darkest horses we had was Zuelim Kiza mm. and uh, David Mabuza himself, uh, of the people who were running right. uh, for president. Uh, beyond that, I, I really don't know. And I don't think any of them uh, imagine. Israeli could still be nominated from the floor. It's possible. David Mabuza seems to have settled for, for joining uh, the slate of Ngosa Zana Lamini Zuma. So I think this is going to be a, uh, a dead hit, mm. uh, as it were, between um, Ramaphosa and Ngosa Zana Lamini Zuma. And the other positions will be competed along the slates mm. that we have seen uh, between the two. Uh, I doubt if there will be many surprises. Mm. It will be either that the person selected by the one slate is defeated by the other, and that's the one who will take the position. Can political careers come to an end oh, yes. having been on the wrong slate? <laughs> I'm can, answering it for you. I'm can, being the political Can political careers here. end as a result of being on the wrong slate this time around? Well, of course. Of course. Of course. <laughs> of course they, 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 they could end. We've seen that happen before. Mm. Uh, there are people who have vanished from the uh, political stratosphere mm -hmm. uh, over the few years as uh, administrations have changed. That's part of what is at stake mm -hmm. uh, in, in these elections. Yeah. That's part of why there is so much uh, intense lobbying uh, going on, because people are also thinking about uh, their own political careers, as well as those people whose own political careers are attached <laughs> to, to the people who might lose. So, so that's part of it, unfortunately. But, but, but one hopes that in the end, we all worry about where the ANC, this glorious movement, is going and how best uh, to salvage it and to save it. That in the end, we all worry about where this country is going and who best to help us uh, salvage the country. I just want to bring up that yeah. the, the issue again. I know I, I asked you a bit earlier, but I think it was probably lost in translation as to how I phrased the question. But we heard the confirmation once again coming from Zizi Kodwa during the conversation with Sophie McQuenna. There was a proposal put forward, and a number of provinces actually liked the proposal. The fact that there could possibly be two deputy presidents of the ANC. However, this has now gone away, it's not going to happen. This won't come through. Uh, I mean, did you think that this was a feasible proposal in the first time, to have two deputy presidents of a party? You know, that, that proposal was, was, was generally met with uh, skepticism and even derision uh, when it was first made, because many people read it, and they could have been wrong as an attempt to ensure that uh, the loser still, still finds a place, uh, as it were. And, and depending on who you think the loser is, you could then go on and um, uh, pillory the person that you think is, is making this proposal. Uh, you know, so it was, it was never a proposal that I thought was met warmly uh, around, uh, uh, by, by many members of the, of the ANC. So I'm not surprised that it has been dropped um, because it, it would be a difficult one to pull off. I mean, on paper, it, it is a good, it looks good, but I think to implement that might have become uh, much more difficult. I mean, so if an organization has many factions, do you feed the sources of the factions? or do you seek to kill the sources of those factions? Mm. You feed the factions if you say, let's include as many people as possible. Those people do not cease to represent their factions just because you have included them. 
you simply complicate mm. yeah. uh, things for the, for the organization. So it, it goes back to what one of you were saying mm. earlier. Would this go to the source of the problem? Would this yeah. address the sources of the ANC's problems? Or would it simply deal with the, symptoms. the symptoms? So uh, another burning question about re-engineering the ANC and how it can function more effectively going forward has this, on the one hand, reducing the size of the NEC, and then on the other, the deployment of NEC members into cabinet. So that you have this situation where you have a powerful head of state who on a Sunday is at an NEC meeting, and then on Monday, 70% of those NEC members are reporting to him directly as their subordinates. And so people would ask the question, how can you wear one hat of oversight, but on the, at the same ticket on Monday, you are a subordinate to the same person. So you end up subordinating yourself in both instances just because you spend more time at work. Yeah, it, it has been one of the issues that have come to a head during the Zuma uh, administration. But I think it has always been an issue for the ANC. Um, it's, it's really a subset of the problem of uh, state versus party. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, a, it's a smaller circle inside of that problem. How far does the party go and when does the state uh, begin to be the state? And when do we mix up the roles uh, between the two? Which, which is a problem that we have seen emerge again and again uh, within the ANC. Now, well, you know, cabinet ministers, unfortunately, are not only powerful, they also have perks that uh, ordinary members of the NEC do not necessarily have. So to be a cabinet minister is likely to be more influ influential on, on, on one than if one were just an ordinary uh, member of the NEC. But I don't think the solution would be to prohibit the appointment of members of the NEC into cabinet. I think what needs to be done is to find a better way for the two uh, structures to, to, to work together. Because if you were to prohibit, then you would create totally parallel structures where cabinet might see itself as totally a different entity that is at odds with the NEC and the NEC might perceive cabinet as, as, as enemy, uh, as part of the hostile forces that the president was talking about last night. You don't want that either. Mm. But couldn't that partly explain the inertia that uh, Ronald Lamola was describing in terms of the NEC seemingly abdicating some of its responsibilities? Well, this NEC was, was really stacked with uh, what uh, some would call Zuma loyalists, particularly this NEC. And so I don't know that, I think the cabinet minister's problem is really an aspect, a dimension, if you like, mm -hmm. of a much larger problem. What this president of the ANC in Jacob Zuma had managed to do has been to take charge and to take full control, if you like, as much control as, as is possible, of the NEC, of the NWC, of all the structures of the movement of, or, or, or the organization uh, that have power. He has done this much better than uh, his predecessor, Tabombeki, has done. So Lutuli House, uh, he was no stranger in Lutuli House. Um, he didn't visit Lutuli House. He lived there and, and took charge of things. And, and, and I think that's part of the problem uh, that, that we, have, we have today. It's the other extreme, because the, you could have an extreme where a president simply barricades themselves in the union buildings and forget what's going on in, in Lutuli House and in the branches and uh, end up uh, being recalled. Okay. So. I want to talk a little, you, you <laughs> keep talking about Ronald yeah. Lamola as well, and we had quite an interesting interview with him, and then, and then a lot of people saying that this guy is the guy to watch, that you really have Which to guy? watch uh, Ronald, Ronald Lamola, who we had him chatting a little bit earlier. Uh, are you, Ronald yes. Lamola? Ronald. So basically saying that uh, 
this is the last time, and to quote him, that two pensioners are going to be running for the position of the president of ANC. That if it's left up to those that are coming in now, this will not be allowed, and that the youth will be given a vote. Um, what do you think? I mean, that's quite a, it's quite a scathing remark. I mean, he's been very scathing about the president, and it's been surprising that Ronald's actually stayed in the ANC this long. But in terms of the, the aging NEC, the aging party of the ANC, um, do you think that this is going to change, and does it need to change? Look, there is a point uh, that he is making which is valid. And the point is that ANC leadership by and far is, is, uh, is quite advanced in age. To borrow uh, an expression from the president that was used yesterday. Um, and, and, and if you contrast that with the DA or the EFF, it is really um, amazing how different uh, the ANC does not even have on the wings uh, a younger person who yeah. you could say is being groomed uh, for, for leadership. Uh, unless you, you are thinking about your Gigabas and your Mbalulas. I'm not so sure that that's why they are where they are, that they are being groomed uh, for leadership. So, so there is a point to be made about the generational uh, issues within the ANC. But I think it's problematic to simply say that the ANC needs to find a younger person, as if being young in and of itself uh, will, will be enough to, to make that person lead and lead well. Any more than being old in and of itself uh, helps a person to lead. So I, I think that what you do, if you really want to have a, an intergenerational mix, is that you have succession planning, and that you begin to plan in that direction and make sure that there are enough young people, younger people, um, as it were, who, who can take up positions. Has the ANC been doing that? Not so visibly in recent years. And, 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 and I think that's, that's the point that Lamula was making. Yeah, certainly, and quite scathing about yeah. it. And, I mean, he, he's been, and, I, and I've said it before, very scathing about President Jacob Zuma. And he's been one of the very loud voices to say, after this conference, he needs to be recalled um, and that in order for the ANC to survive it needs to die. Uh, he said some really interesting things and quite, quite harsh things. If we talk about a recall, and I know we've spoken about this quite a lot, but do you think the possibility and the probability of this is getting higher and higher that President Jacob Zuma, and especially after his speech yesterday, because he was having some underlying um, comments at, at a lot, particularly at Sura Ramaphosa. I mean, a lot was said about him during that, without saying his name, to bring up Marikana, to bring up court cases, to bring up the judiciary, to bring up many instances. But do you think the foundation is there for his recall come January or come the end of this conference? Well, l let me start by referring to the words of the, general, the current General Secretary, outgoing General Secretary of the ANC. Uh, he himself has said that it will be easier to recall uh, uh, President Jacob Zuma once he is no longer president of the ANC. He's, he's, and, and I think he has been consistent about this. He has said it before that it, it is not possible to recall him. Part of the reason is that you can't recall a sitting president of the, of the ANC. And he, of course, implied that it was it was possible for, for Tabum Beke because at that time he was no longer president of the ANC. So we'll have to see if this is indeed uh, what, what is likely to happen. What happens, of course, is that the NEC that comes in uh, is, is, is usually an NEC that is not loyal to, to, the, to, to the outgoing uh, president. It's more loyal to the incoming president. Yeah. But does the ANC want to do a recall again? Uh, is that the path they want to follow? Um, or is this, in fact, the only way of, getting, uh, of removing a president uh, for the ANC? 
without blood on the floor. <laughs> yeah, right. You know. Prof Malaleka, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you very, very much indeed. Um, and that is a big question that needs to be answered. And we certainly can't. Nobody can, because we don't even know who's going to be the president yet. All of that will be answered in the coming days. But uh, what we can help you with is the headlines at this hour. A very good afternoon. This is PM News coming to you live from Johannesburg. It is 3 p.m. Central African time. I'm Simpio Ngoan. Let's now take a look at the top stories making news headlines.